Is that better? <laughs> and um, th the uh, school committee on January 13th uh, had asked for the superintendent's recommended budget to include all components of the needs assessment. And so uh, this is a different looking budget than we had presented last year. So we wanted to frame that a little bit. We wanted to um, just acknowledge that there is a, a bit of a difference um, in this year's budget than in the past. I'm in trouble. All right, let me take it off and put it back on. We go. Um, for those of you who don't know who I am, um, I have the honor of being the superintendent of schools for Groton Dunstable Regional School District. This is my second year here in the district, and I am going to be presenting uh, tonight's FY17 budget with my colleague, uh, Jared Stanton. Jared um, is our director of business and finance here in the district, and um, although you only see two of us up here, I would like to be really clear that this was a very comprehensive uh, process of soliciting um, information, subject, data, um, and um, hard work from all members of our school community, um, our staff, our administrators, and the school committee. There was a lot of work that went into this, so I just wanted to acknowledge all of those members that contributed to it. I have the honor of being up here and sharing it with you, but it certainly was a collective pursuit. So I'd like to start today's budget hearing with a few quotes. They pretty much say the same thing. And that is what we budget for, what we fund, reflects what we as a community value. Both quotes, one of which is from Mike Pence regarding overall kind of federal funding, and the second is from a colleague of our school committee. Her name is Tracy Novick. She's a former school committee member and now is a field director for the Mass Associations of School Committees. And she tweeted this out just on the 29th of January. And there was such uh, a parallel to those two uh, quotes that I wanted to share them. And so I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but this was one of the reasons, this concept of what we fund is, in, is what we value and that budgeting is a moral pursuit was one of the rationales because we're talking about children and the needs of children for why the committee um, requested of me to include all components of the needs assessment into this year's budget. So I just wanted to frame that concept a little bit. Um, a number of uh, people in this room, in the audience as well, participated in a future search uh, process with us back on January 29th and 30th. It was a Friday evening and an all-day Saturday experience. And we had over 80 participants who uh, were involved in the process. And what we did was we reviewed the history of the town, the district, and the national framework. And the following major implications of our history, our local and um, national history, what those implications were for our school. So I just want to share the five biggest themes that came out of that work. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because this was not just a subsection of a small group of people in a room kind of deciding, similar to what we as representatives, as your elective officials, school committee has to do. This was 80 participants that represented the full spectrum of our community. So there were elected officials in the group, there were parents in the group, there were community members in the group who don't have children in the schools, there were uh, community organizations present, staff were present, so it was a really wonderful cross-section of our community. And if anyone's interested in seeing the full overview, I did post this to the website um, earlier this week, and I will um, be blasting that out in the blog, my weekly blog, a link to the overview. But I'm just going to touch on a couple of things. The ones that relate to tonight. And the number one um, implication of our history that has impacted us as a district is the, the feeling from this group, overall arching feeling from this group, that we have had inadequate school funding. And potentially, um, because of that, that we're not meeting the needs of the whole child. And potentially leading into that is that there's been unstable 
district leadership who hasn't really had the opportunity to be in the district long enough to look at the data and to come up with an authentic needs assessment to identify some of the issues we have. Two other things that were identified. Um, this one was really important, and that is that we are a regional school district, and we are two towns, but we are one community and one district. So it, we have to make sure that when we talk about what our needs are, when we think about school funding, when we consider the whole child, we do it as a group, we do it collectively. And that has, at times, had opportunities for collaboration, and at times, opportunities for tension. And the, the committee, the, the, the future search group, just wanted that to be articulated. The other is our technology needs, which are ongoing, and as many of you know, we are developing a technology plan that will be presented in the spring that will explore a little bit what our technology needs are. Here's what we're really proud of. This is what the future search group said they were really proud of. Strong district performance over time in current programs such as the Big Book of Peace, and I might be using some terms and some programs that people might not be familiar with, uh, but this is a wonderful, um, the Big Book of Peace is a uh, decade long um, work group of students who produced, at the time, the largest book about peace and had contributors such as um, the Dalai Lama contribute to this book and it was uh, recently just published. We had a big uh, ceremony in the Kennedy Center and um, we have an opportunity for it to be shown at the UN. This is a big deal. This is something that's nationally news, and I'm really proud to share that this is what people are proud of. This is the work that our staff does with students uh, that really works. PAVE program is another example that was cited. The PAVE program is a new program that we developed a few years ago under the leadership of Principal Mistrullo. And what it is is it's, a, it's a, a vocational academic program for students between the ages of 14 and 22, primarily 18 to 22. And these are the students that, uh, by law, were required to provide special education services to students up to age 22 that need and require them. And instead of sending them out of district and sending them um, to different places, we created a program here in the high school for them, vocational opportunities for them in the community. You might even see some of these students um, you know, participating in vocational opportunities within our community. And the pay program here is something that people are very proud of. You might have heard about some of the new things they've done with Best Buddies and, and whatnot. The Challenge League, um, those are some of the um, sporting events that have uh, been opened up to special education students. And then um, our international student programs, of which you just heard, our students are traveling internationally. We have a foreign exchange program to encourage diversity in our school, bringing students in. The rigor of our AP options, these are just things that people are really proud of. Existing staff, um, this one was uh, right at the top of the list, high quality. And, and again, the terms I'm using are the terms that I collected from the information that all of the different groups provided. This is, this is uh, verbatim from wording that was provided to me. High quality, hardworking, collaborative, and dedicated teachers and staff. Um, this feels very awkward to say because I think it includes me, but it is certainly not exclusive. Um, is people's uh, confidence in the current administration, the level of stability in the current administration, and uh, their investment in the work that they do. So there are a number of administrators. Um, Mr. Stanton is here, Dr. Novak is here, Mrs. Garden is here, as just examples of the great talented leadership we have. Uh, parents and community, parent and community members are supported and invested, and we can't leave our, one of our most precious assets, the most precious asset, which is our students who are trustworthy, these are the terms that the community used to describe them, respectful and committed to excellence. Here's those things that we're sorry about as a community. Number one, and this is based on how often, how frequently it was cited, loss of staffing and programming, cuts to staff resulting in large class sizes, and the loss of programs, such as the impacts on our foreign language program, gym, the arts, library, uh, which has resulted in some overall lowering of achievement. School finances, sustained underfunding and overall financial instability have created a budget hole for education. Again, terminology that our community created. The social emotional needs of our students. There's inadequate social emotional support for all the students and limited mental health services to those who need it. The fourth that they had mentioned was meeting the needs of all students. 
There's a need to meet the needs of all students, provide individual learning, and close the gaps in special education. And five of the sorries that the group identified, outside factors impeding the district focus, mandates from the state or federal government um, that have required the district to focus on things such as standardized testing and compliance and not allowed us to focus on things such as innovation. So at the Future Search and uh, in a number of different um, opportunities, I've shared the needs assessment findings, which contributes and supports what the community felt and said at our meeting. And I don't know if I could just see from the audience, uh, how many people have heard my needs assessment findings spiel? Quite a few. Okay. So I probably will limit it and go <laughs> forward a little, which is great, by the way. I'm super excited that there's so many that had. So I won't go through them to the depth, but I'm going to highlight a few things. These are the five key findings that we found. We need to reverse declining student performance in core areas, English, math, science, social studies, and history. I'm um, sorry, in high school, foreign language, those are all considered core subject areas. This has been caused by the loss of essential staffing and resources. We need to restore and improve programs to meet the needs of students in the areas of the arts, library science, physical behavioral health, technology, engineering, and foreign language. We need to provide comprehensive social and emotional support to our students. We need to improve performance of students with disabilities. Sound familiar, right? I really feel like the community really understands and keys into what our needs are as a district. And lastly, we need to provide essential support services, including kindergarten assistants, technology support staff, nursing staff, custodial and maintenance staff, business office staff, and administrative assistants. So I'm going to touch on one or two from each finding. Or maybe not. There we go. Um, I'm going to point out the first one because this is actually new. I've been doing this roadshow, this needs assessment roadshow, um, and I have been citing how many of our core classes, remember those are our core subject areas, how many of our core classes were over the size of 25 at the high school, but I ran a real schedule. And as you just found out, we as a district are on a semester, similar to what a college is. So they get a whole year's worth of a class in a half a year. So when I ran the authentic numbers back in September, it was only for half of the year. On 2-1, I ran the full schedule because now we had it solidified. Now we have more than almost doubled the amount of core classes. This year alone, 52 core. That's geometry, that's English 9, that's English 10. Those are our core classes, US history. 52 of them have over 25 students in them. 11 core classes at the middle school. And so, again, I, I wanted you to share that, that one point in particular because that is a new data point that I didn't even have as recently as our January 29th and 30th meeting because we weren't able to run those new schedules till we really implemented those. So that's, um, in a lot of minds, shocking to a lot of people. Another thing that's worth talking about is the instructional materials. We spent $124 per pupil on instructional materials. Uh, we did this in 2014. That's the last state comparison that we had available to us, which sounds OK until you look at what the state average is and the best in class average is over $400, both of them. And the fact that back in FY13, we spent 207 per pupil, which, um, by the way, um, we found out that um, in FY16, our budget was 48,805, because Jared's here, otherwise I'd say close to 50,000. 48,805 less than FY10, and in FY10 we were the 14th lowest in the state. So we're spending less than we were back in 2010 on our instructional materials and resources. And we have a lot of parents in the room, and you know that either our textbooks and materials are out of date, and you're also contributing a lot more to general supplies that you wouldn't have had in the past. A couple of things that I want to just highlight. I don't know if everyone knows this. Um, back in 09, we had four certified librarians. They were replaced with paraeducators who were not certified teachers. And in FY11, the middle school library was cut even further. Currently, right now, at the middle school, we have two libraries, a south building and a north building, five, six, and one, seven, eight, and the other. Every other day, our library is closed to them because we have one paraeducator between the two. And so the door is locked to those kids every other day. 
Um, we have only one day a week of physical education at the elementary level where we used to have two. We have no foreign language at the elementary level anymore where we used to have it. Back in FY09, we had it at all grade levels. Um, I'm sorry, in FY09 it was cut back, and then 10 it was cut altogether, and we have never replaced that. Um, a, one or two other points just that are um, important to realize. Um, we did an analysis of, of best-in-class districts. We're the only one not to offer 3D art. We're the only one not to offer drama. We have the highest student-to-teacher ratio in music and the second highest in visual arts at our high school level. At the middle school, we have 33 integrated arts classes that have over 25 students in them, ranging from 26 to 36 students. In regard to the social emotional needs, the state uh, Massachusetts School Counselors Association recommends a 1 to 250 ratio. Florence Roach is in the house. Florence Roach has a 1 to 540 counselor to student ratio. In terms of how much we spend on our guidance support, we can see why we have this as an identified need. When we looked at root causes, well, here it is. We don't have the enough staffing that is recommended, and we're not spending enough. In 2014, the district spent $185 per student. Back in FY13, we spent more, $257 per student. Best in class average is 508. That's the average, 508 per student. Um, one or two key facts here. We cut all tier two support for students, which means uh, we have students that are in a general education setting, and then those that are not, um, that are struggling a little bit, generally we provide a little support for them, things like reading teachers. We cut reading teachers back between FY9 and FY13. Two and a half reading teachers were cut. We have no math interventionists at the elementary level and only one at the middle school level. We only have two co-taught classes at the elementary level, and that was by reorganization and taking advantage of a one-year fellowship with a college, with a university. We have no learning assessment management system. We never implemented multi-tiered system of support because we didn't have the staff to do it. So multi-tiered system of support is what the state came out with as a recommendation, a blueprint for how you meet the needs of all children. We didn't have the staff to implement it. So even though it came out in 2011, this district does not have tiered support. Vital support services, just a couple of things. I don't know if you realize our half-day kindergarten classrooms, the, um, the kindergarten assistants were eliminated back in 2010. They're still not in there. And I always joke about this, but it's true. If you ever had four or five, four or five five-year-olds at your house for a period, how's that feel? You have to imagine um, over 20 students in your class, they only have a half-day program, and they have a whole year that they have to teach of standards in that half-day program without a classroom assistant. We um, eliminated a .5 nursing assistant at Florence Roach, and right now we tracked how many visits. Over 7,000 visits were on record for last school year with one nurse. We received a letter from the state citing us that our ratios at the high school were off. The district technology staff was recently cut from five members to four. We did ratios. We are hundreds off the device to technology support staff ratios, hundreds off, so hundreds of devices off. In FY10, office secretarial supports were reduced, and our record secretary was reduced. We were unable to process records over the summer to get immunizations um, reviewed, special education placements, because we don't have the staff over the summer to review those. We currently have 18 custodians. We have the same amount of buildings that we did back in 2009, but back then we employed 23 custodians. In 2009, the district reduced the maintenance department by one person and added fields and maintenance since then. So right now we have four people maintaining all six buildings, over 80, I'm sorry, 90 acres of grounds, and 10 athletic fields. When I ask people what are some of the issues in the community, fields come up quite often. If you think about um, uh, the difference between a regional district and a municipal district, we are responsible for plowing our own um, schools in a regional district. The town, it, we work, collaborate great, they get the roads, but we're responsible for our own school grounds, whereas in most municipal districts that's covered by the DPW. So these same people are here, 
And they same people worked almost over 20 hours recently and had to come back into work the next day because somebody needs to be available to um, be there if we have maintenance needs when the students are in session. Okay. Good evening. I'll be quick. No one really is here for the numbers, I'm sure. <laughs> so, uh, and I have my notes, as, as Dr. Rodriguez says, I, I don't know how to round up, so I didn't memorize much of the, much of the numbers. Uh, but I'll try and be, uh, be as brief as possible. Um, so we're going to be talking today about uh, the 2017 superintendent's recommended budget. And the first slide is here talking about the, uh, the big budget drivers. The FY17 superintendent's recommended budget is $4,025,000. $509 higher than FY16's adopted budget. There are many things that make up the differences and it's all spelled out in our comprehensive uh, budget booklet. I think it's about 200 pages with the assessments and needs um, and appendices. The first big driver is the staffing for the needs assessment uh, which includes precisely 39.74 FTEs. In addition, the district needed to hire additional staff mostly paraeducators in FY16 to be in compliance with IEPs. These positions were not budgeted in FY16 and the full salaries were rolled over into FY17's budget. Another big driver is the district restored school instructional materials to FY10's levels. This was $48,805 more than FY16's adopted budget. In addition, to support the needs assessment, we increased our curriculum PD lines uh, $100,000. The last two drivers on this list will always be on there. We must account for all finalized collective bargaining agreements, which include steps, lanes, raises for all of our staff. It should be noted that our FY17 anticipated lane changes for Unit A staff is almost 55,000 more than FY15 actuals. Lastly, we anticipate a 9% increase to our health insurance. In FY16, our rates went up 9.2%. The commission will vote uh, FY17 health plans on Wednesday, March 2nd. Once we get those numbers, um, we will adjust our superintendent's budget accordingly. So I just wanted to share, um, I'm sure everyone can read this beautifully, right? It's not hard at all. Um, obviously, this is just a screen snapshot that comes from um, our budget booklet. So you can see all of this. And for every single one of these pages in the appendix, we included the rationale, which has research base behind it, which has the data behind why we have the position and what our intentions are to do it. And in addition, if you look at the crosswalk that the committee helped us develop, it talks directly about what the data says, what the identified needs are, and uh, what our initiatives are going to be to address those and the um, accompanying uh, staff. So there's a lot more information than I'm sharing here. Uh, what you will see is there is a, a strong and distinct focus on instructional services here uh, to meet the needs of all of our learners. So this is exactly what we've shared in uh, past iterations. It's in the budget booklet. There is um, no additions um, to administrative staff, uh, but there is a lot of additions to um, instructional and support staff, as you can see here. So again, um, when you look at things like special education co-teachers, uh, literacy teachers, uh, math teachers, uh, social studies teachers, these are our basic baseline. There was no um, innovation based in the request. That was what we were told, um, only include the, uh, well, to include the needs assessment was comprehensive enough. Um, we, as a district, had already identified we're not going to be able to get to innovative practices. This is, these are our raw needs. So you can see here when we say we're the only one not to offer um, a, a drama class and um, a, a 3D art. Um, these are why you're seeing there's a direct correlation and the crosswalk defines that very distinctly um, for everybody. But I just wanted to put it all up here so people can see what we're talking about when we say um, that many positions. So in addition to budget drivers, uh, we have budget assumptions in our budget booklet. Um, first, uh, the budget contains FY17 actual, current, projected salaries 
steps, lanes for all employees. At this time last year, we were still negotiating with a number of our units. As I said in my past slide, we budgeted for a 9% increase in health insurance, and again, we'll know more on March 2nd and adjust accordingly. We are currently in negotiations with Delta Dental, but we plan for a 2.5 increase. Um, that's based on a five-year average, as well as ongoing negotiations with them currently. The debt amount represents actual amounts. We have a schedule of projected debts that we gave to the two towns up to 2028. I work closely with the facilities department and we assumed not only five years of actuals, but recent trend rates for all of our utilities. The governor's, budget, initial, uh, the governor's initial budget was released on January 27th. Although the final budget will not be passed until well off after the town meetings in springtime, um, even though we need to get our budget passed well before then. And, and according to these early estimates, uh, the district is receiving about $47,600 additional money in Chapter 70 uh, aid than we received in FY16. I don't expect this number to go down, uh, so that's a, that's a good thing. For Chapter 71, though, which is regional transportation aid, uh, we budgeted roughly 65% of FY16's total expenses for in-district uh, transportation. I am currently hearing that we will receive anywhere from 62 to 68 percent reimbursement. Um, so I feel that the, even though the, uh, the, the Chapter 70, 71 aid often fluctuates, um, 65 percent is a good number at this time. I could just uh, contribute one thing. Sure. Um, I, I did um, want to um, just take a, a step back. Um, one of the things when we presented uh, to the two towns and we shared the needs assessment with the two towns, one of the things that the towns had asked for us is to kind of think about what the compounding costs are for uh, the staff. And uh, you will see in the appendix to the budget booklet, there is a five-year model that shows the assumptions we have, similar to what Jared just talked about, and how those costs in the needs assessment, the salaries, the benefits included in those, um, any, any um, um, inflation to some of the items um, over a five-year five model. So I just, we, we're not gonna talk about that today, but it was something that was, uh, the towns had asked us to do, and so that is included in the appendices. It's the section, it's pretty much the last section of the second document right before the needs assessment. to save money, uh, reduce assessments and costs, and FY17 is, is no different. Uh, I wanted to highlight some of the big things that we, we plan on doing or did do uh, for FY16 and FY17. The first one is we allowed our printer service to expire in FY15 because of concerns surrounding poor support and adjustable monthly cost. We sound on, uh, sorry. <laughs> We signed on with a, another uh, company in a new contract that has fixed monthly costs, which will save the district's, uh, district roughly $15,000 a year. Although fewer total printers are covered, new high capacity printers were added in addition to carefully selecting existing district printers capable of maintaining the same level of printing needs for our staff. In prior years, the district website uh, was a fixed cost, a monthly cost which included software and user fees. Um, this monthly expenditure was set to increase in part because changes outside of the district's control uh, relating to E-rate eligibility. The terms of E-rate were modified and the costs associated with the software and support were set to substantially increase. Uh, um, as a part of a new district communication strategy, a new custom design website was introduced in FY16 after an initial outlay of 10000 for the one-time design fee paid in FY16, in FY17, we can expect the costs surrounding the maintenance and support of this district website to be close to zero. A contingency fund will be included for the updates on an as-needed basis, but will most likely not be needed, and we estimate that the yearly savings on this will be $6,000. In FY15, the district used a, uh, bought a used van to do all in-district special education uh, paved program runs. 
This van is used daily throughout the school year as well as the summer, and the savings is about $26,000 a year. Uh, hand dryers uh, were installed in three schools, Swallow Union and the middle schools. Uh, we will continue to install the hand dryers till all lavatories are completely outfitted with hand dryers. Um, this will reduce the cost for paper towels in the district, and we estimate about 5,000 plus savings per year by putting these in. At Swallow Union, we replaced the inefficient hot water heater which ran off the boiler with a high efficiency electric hot water tank. Um, now the boiler can be shut down uh, during the warmer months. Last year, the district worked with Kevin Kelly in Groton Electric and upgraded the Florence Roach lighting. This will reduce associated energy consum consumption by 63% annually, which will result in approximately $23,000 and $11 if you want, if you want the exact, uh, in savings each year. The thing is we won't realize this savings until May of 2018 because the cost of the project cost $50,700 and we're paying that off in our electric bills. Uh, so once we pay that off um, in May of 2018, we'll start seeing that savings. Uh, ceiling mounted distratification uh, fans were installed in the gyms of the high school, two middle schools and Swallow Union. These fans will uh, recirculate the heat buildup in the ceiling area of the, of the gym to the floor area. Yearly savings is about 1,100 therms of heat per unit, and there are about four units per building. Um, this is my favorite one, actually, to conserve water and reduce sewer costs. We have installed smart valves for urinals in Swallow Union and Florence Road Schools. This reduces the water consumption up to 40 gallons per urinal per year in an estimated savings of up to 600 per urinal. We will continue to install these in the high school and the two middle schools. Um, Dr. Novak uh, continues to find cost saving measures to support the curriculum department and district uh, professional development. For example, she has presented out of district and provided the district with their honorarium. This school year, she is scheduled for eight sessions where all travel and mileage are paid by the sponsoring district and all honorariums are paid directly to Groton Dunstable. This year, we anticipate total payments to be approximately $10,000. Also during the summer of 2015, Dr. Novak taught two three credit graduate courses through Fitchburg State University at no cost to the district. For all other classes offered through Fitchburg State, instructors are paid $1,000 a credit. This was an additional savings of $6,000. For FY17, she will continue to teach two courses for the district and has plans for the district partnerships that can provide up to $30,000 in anticipated professional development savings. I also want to just share a few other um, a few other items. We had, um, as I mentioned, we had an introduction of a Mandarin course. It's a pilot program. Um, and we uh, went out for competitive grant funding and that was um, able to uh, fund that grant. And because we don't have um, foreign language at the elementary level, the community service um, project that this Mandarin teacher, which we don't pay for at all, she has been doing an after school. It's not ideal, but at least something for our students, an after school Mandarin club for some of our elementary students. Um, and I, I referenced this very briefly, but I just want to um, acknowledge it. Uh, we have a need for co-teaching right now. We piloted it at the Florence Roach School at one of the grade levels, and uh, we um, we did that through a fellowship, which means this is a, a student at Merrimack who um, is a full-time student and a fellow there, and it cost us roughly the cost of a paraeducator versus the full cost of a licensed teacher, even though we are getting a licensed teacher. But again, um, the reason that this is low on the list is some of these will sustain year after year. These kinds of competitive grants or grants that we go after or options are not necessarily sustainable. So if we need to continue with these positions, which we do, we have built those, by the way, into the FY17 budget to be realistic. Yes, we're gonna still go for another competitive grant, so if we can continue with our Mandarin program for next year, we get that grant, great, but we can't um, assume that we're gonna get that competitive grant. So uh, we had to be thoughtful about that in our budgeting. So now I'm gonna start getting into the 
fun part here, all, all these numbers. Um, so again, FY17's general fund budget, as you can see up there, is $4,025,509 uh, $4, or 11.04% higher than FY16's adopted budget. Much of this increase is to fund the cost of the needs assessment. FY17's assessment in increase with debt is $3,939,133, which is a difference of $3,315,187 over FY16's assessment to the two towns. The superintendent's recommended budget includes an operating assessment of $25 872,975, you can see that right up there. Groton's share of this is $20,160,143, and Dunstable's share is $5,712,832. The total assessments with debt um, is $27,377,813. Groton's share of this is $21,303,000. $717, and Dunstable's share is $6,074,906. Again, on the 27th of January, the governor's FY17 recommended budget was released. Uh, chapter 70, uh, you can see that up there, was projected to be $10,623,273, which again is $47,600 more than we received in uh, this fiscal year. Chapter 71 of transportation aid uh, is unpredictable, like I said. It uh, varies from year to year. The amount budgeted was based, again, on FY16 end-of-year report that was sent to the state this past October. The district, again, anticipates between a 62 and a 68% reimbursement of those costs uh, for total in-district transporta uh, transportation for all students who live one and a half miles from their school. FY17's budgeted amount is $57,400 more than FY16's budgeted amount. The district, the district is projecting a slight increase to Medicaid reimbursement based on FY15 actuals. In addition, charter reimbursements were increased based on the latest information from the state. They uh, produce these cherry sheets, and we get our information from that. Lastly, the district again increased uh, Peter Toomey Youth Center rent to cover increased expenses such as plowing and sanding of program sites. This increase uh, reduces assessments by that same amount. This question has actually come up as people have uh, reviewed the budget booklet, and I just wanted to offer clarity before Jared goes on, and he's going to talk about in his narrative, but I had said there's no additional administrators, and when you look at here, uh, Function 1000, District Leadership and Administration, it's up a significant amount. I just want to let everyone know, um, prior to us having an assistant superintendent three or so years ago, that position was a, a curriculum director position, um, so it was in the instructional services line, which is the 2000 line. It is an assistant superintendent position, so based on the chart of accounts and our accounting, we um, wanted to rectify where it was placed. So there's a, a large addition to the amount. It's no different. Um, it's no additional salaries. It's just the assistant superintendent and the administrative assistant to the assistant superintendent being put in the proper function. You don't see a decrease because the instructional services is all of our teachers and the needs assessment boosted that up. But if it was a straight one-to-one, -one, you would have seen a decline in there. So that came out of instructional services and got added into uh, the proper function that it should have been all along. And in addition to that, it includes parts of the needs assessment that we talked about, the business clerk and the two network technicians. So I wanted to offer clarity to the community. There are no new administrators that are a component of our FY17 budget. Yes, as, as Dr. Rodriguez says, this is strictly done for accounting and reporting purposes. Um, so that is the, the, the main reason for the large increase to the 1,000 function, which is district leadership and administration. And the 2,000 instructional services, again, went mostly out because most of our needs assessment are being paid through this, uh, this function. Um, so I'll move on to the 3,000 function. Um, other school services, that's increasing about $190,000. This is a function where addition, the additional lunch aides and the um, athletic uh, uh, secretary salary are being paid from. Uh, both of these additions, again, were part of the needs assessment. 
Uh, also, our in-district transportation costs contributed to this increase. The maintenance function, uh, that's up about $215,000, uh, mostly due to the additions of one maintenance worker and two custodians, which are part of the needs assessment, as well as a slight increase in our total utilities. The main reason for the increase in fixed charges, uh, which is the 5000 function, is just the growing cost of health care. Fixed assets is up 29000 uh, because the district is in need of a new truck for the maintenance department, and that's the main reason for that going up. Debt retirement and service is down because our debt is going down. And programs with other districts, which includes all of our tuitions, uh, at this time was, was level funded basically because we were able to restore our circuit breaker revolving account, um, which I'll talk about later when I talk about revolving accounts, which helped offset some of these tuitions. So this next slide is, is excess and deficiency. Um, so according to MGL chapter 71, section 16 B and a half, if anyone wants some really great reading, um, the district is required to maintain an E&D, is what I'm going to call it. It's called E&D, excess and deficiency account, uh, to record the net surplus or deficit in the general fund and have it certified by the Department of Revenue every single year. The district has maintained a substantial level of E&D through FY13, and I think you can see that right there, ranging from 767000 to roughly $1.6 million. A pattern of, e and, uh, a pattern of uh, budgeting E&D as a funding source uh, occurred in FY10 through FY14 in an effort to support an adequate budget while controlling assessments. All available E&D from FY13, though, was used to close out the deficit that happened in FY14. Through careful management of FY14 spending, um, it allowed the district to end the year in a surplus. Um, and even though we had to use all of our E&D, we ended the year again in a surplus, and they, they certified our E&D at the end of FY14 at $374,263. In FY15, the combined revenue and expenditure surplus of roughly 446,000 uh, resulted in a projected E&D for the end of last fiscal year at about $800,000. So we're still waiting on the DOI to certify that, but that's 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 pretty good. That was our that was our goal for last year to get it up. Um, a target for E&D is roughly between three and a half and four percent of your operating budget or your, or your general fund budget, um, which would be a, you know, a substantial balance for unforeseen expenditures such as you know, boilers, special ed tuitions, um, and would also be a positive factor for the district's bond rating. So it's really important to have a, you know, some, a good E&D balance for, for bonds. Uh, according, accordingly, 35 to 4% of FY16's adopted budget of $36,449,830 would give a range of roughly $1.3 to $1.45 million. Uh, it will take the district a number of years to achieve this percentage, but we'd love to get there um, eventually. Uh, you'll see on this slide the reserve for expenditure account. Um, it consists of e and funds voted by the school committee to be used as a funding source for future expenditures. Once voted and approved, the funds are reclassified into the reserve for expenditure. And you, you can see here that, um, sorry. Uh, since our team uh, had come in and realized um, that we are far, far under recommended levels and vulnerable because we don't have uh, that contingency amount, that we have not expended those because we realize we need to build that up. So we've been um, conservative, obviously, in, in understanding that we need to build this up to the recommended levels. So operating assessments. So this is how assessments are calculated. Um, per the district's regional agreement, the basic formula for the operating assessment is operating budget less other revenue sources equals the amount assessed to towns. So the operating budget minus chapter 70, 71, the difference is what we assess the towns. Um, operating assessment is based upon minimum local contribution as determined by DESI. 
The amount to be assessed in excess of minimum local contribution is assessed based on each town's percentage share of um, student enrollment on October 1st, the October 1st enrollment. Debt assessment is based upon each town's student enrollment in each of the school buildings. Uh, therefore, the assessment is calculated separately uh, for each individual bond issue and then aggregated. Because of enrollments by town fluctuates somewhat from year to year, um, the share of debt assessment also fluctuates. But we, we give the towns, like I said, that debt schedule, and it goes up and down just a little bit each year. So as you can see from this, this line graph, you know, federal and state grants is, is really declining. Um, in FY16, we were receiving roughly $783,000 in federal, state, and private grant funding. The major source of the district's grant funding is uh, a federal special education allocation grant, which funds paraprofessionals, special education contract services, supplies, and some tuitions. Total grant revenues decreased from FY15 to FY16 by $7,883. Uh, likewise, the district anticipates a slight decrease to our grant funding in FY17 due to downward trends of the past 10 years of federal and state allocations, uh, excluding the ARA and the Ed Job grants that were received in 2009 to 2012. to check with our chair because this is a statistic that he's given out in uh, public forums before but I think it's really important to note um, you can see the decline in the amount of grants that we have gotten there has also been a decline in the amount of aid that we have received in terms of the overall percentage so back in 2005 around 49 percent of um, our overall costs were funded through um, state aid um, in 2015, only 35% of our overall cost. So uh, by design, the way that the state allocates resources to us, which we have no control over, the um, percentage of how much they're contributing to the cost of the district has declined significantly, and our costs are increasing, which means there is a direct correlation between how the towns are assessed based on the overall percentage. And we just want the community to realize that we recognize that, um, and that's out of our control, but it is a worthy statistic for the community to know. So this shows our revolving uh, fund balances as of the end of last fiscal year. Um, and as you can see, they're all healthy right now, except for the athletic. Uh, but it's important to point out that we reduced the athletic deficit from $31,662, and we cut it in roughly in half last year to 16257 and our goal is to get this healthy um, by the beginning of FY18. Um, the district was able to restore a combined $843,000 uh, last year um, in all of our revolving accounts from 7114 to 63015, but that was the planned goal of the FY15 budget. We, we did that on purpose. We needed that um, to, to restore these back to uh, the healthy um, funds that they were uh, prior to FY14. The expense in salaries in our revolving accounts have decreased, uh, have increased for FY17, $80,000. And the FTE amount increased just 0.24 FTE in F from FY16's budget amount. Again, now that these uh, accounts are healthy, we can return to funding previously funded amounts to help lower the general fund as well as assessments. So we're going to bring it back to the same quote we began with, which is, we fund what we value. And we know that our communities value our children, our students, our staff, and our schools. We also understand the realities of the cost that we're presenting here. Um, but we wanted to um, recognize and appreciate that, as the community said, it's years and years of underfunding and years and years of cuts. And uh, right now, we as a district um, are a level two district. Um, there's a rating that the state gives us from level one to 
uh, level five, level one is the highest rating. And for years and years, we were a level one district. We were very proud of that. Uh, cuts in resources, materials, aligning with the new standards, and professional development cuts, and staffing cuts, and programmatic cuts, and intervention cuts have resulted in a designation as a level two district. Um, beginning back around 2012 or so, um, where we saw a, a growing gap between our special education students and our general education students. And just this year, uh, the state held us harmless because of a new assessment. Had they not held us harmless because of this new assessment, all three of our schools that take this new assessment, both elementaries and the middle school, not just with the special ed subgroup, but overall, would be designated as a level two. So we just want um, people to understand we are here, it is my role and responsibility to advocate for the kids in the district. And on behalf of the school committee who requested us to do that, we did our due diligence and uh, shared as, as in as much of a transparent nature as we could. We know it's very narrative heavy, our budget booklet, but what we want to ask the community is, if you have any questions, or you have anything that is of interest to you, or you don't understand, go to that section in our budget booklet, and there is narrative to support it. It will understand. So, for example, questions come up with, why did that uh, leader admin line, it, if you went into the budget booklet and you looked in there, it says it, it does. But we understand that it's very lengthy. So we're not asking everyone to read all of the pages, all 200 plus pages of it, but if there's an area of interest uh, that people question, uh, we definitely uh, try to be as um, transparent as we could in um, outlining those for the community. So with that, our presentation, lengthy as it was, great job, you kept up, it's late, um, has, has concluded. So we're gonna um, open the floor up to the chair to progress. Anybody on the committee have any questions? I know you all got the information early, so um, any questions, comments? Oh. Okay. Um, so I want to open the floor to the, um, to the audience to ask any questions, comments. This is really a chance for the school committee to hear from the community as far as the budget goes. Any questions that you have, uh, thoughts that you have on it? Um, and I just want to sort of lay out the ground rules. We have it on the back of our agenda, but I'll just kind of highlight a couple key items. Um, first of all, if, if people do want to speak, we're going to give everybody a turn to speak. I'd like to have people who haven't spoken have a turn before somebody else gets up and speaks again. Uh, comments would be limited to three minutes per person. Try not to repeat something that um, a previous speaker has said, if, if possible. Uh, any questions, comments should be addressed to the chair and then I'll uh, either hand it off to the superintendent or answer it myself. Um, and then uh, finally, you know, we're all part of the same community so I just ask, uh, I know that uh, school issues, financial issues are passionate issues for people but uh, let's just be respectful to each other, to the audi other audience members, other speakers uh, to, to make sure that we're showing appropriate respect for everybody and their opinions can be heard so before we start um, there's a lot of empty seats over here for those of you who are standing yeah, you wanna... want to sit uh, if you do have a question you can come up to the mic or we can deliver the mic out to the audience you can either come up or we'll hand it back to you uh, just announce your name and what what town you're from Jack Rosen West Groton for years I've been fighting the override and I will continue to fight the override. The senior citizens in this town can support, can't support this override. And you're asking over 600 bucks from all of them. I'm almost 80. I'm sick of working. And my taxes are over 12,000 a year. And that's with the farm discount. And I know my next door neighbor left her home this summer, just walked away from it because she couldn't pay her taxes. She's living in low, low income housing down in there. And this can't continue. You people have to find a better way than taking money from the senior citizens. And one of my pet peeves is the empty school buses. I've always said I never see a full school bus. And I've asked for years that you people pick up and find out how many kids are not riding the bus are being brought home or brought here by their parents. And the parents should pick up the tab for the empty seat. 
by having the ticket, the kids have a ticket. When they get on the bus, give the driver the ticket. And if they don't get on the bus, the parent pays for the, the ride. That's one of my pet peeves. There's a lot of them. And I will be fighting the override. SOS, I've been doing this since the 80s, and I'll continue to do it. Uh, do you, the, the question on the buses has come up before, so. Um, I think I brought it up it, No, no it, uh, it, it came up in a recent meeting, so I just, we can provide some background on that just as far as how, how the bus routes work. And so essentially the, um, the district is required to have a seat, have enough buses to have a seat for every student, whether they get driven to school, whether they walk to school, or whether they take the bus to school. Um, so we're required to have a minimum I know that. of speeds. I know that. Yes. But I can remember when the Prescott School was open, I would not go to Groton until after 9 because the mothers had the whole town plugged up. Um, if I could speak to your question, because this has come up, and it's a great question, is, you know, how come other towns, they charge a bus fee, for example? How come we don't charge a, a bus fee? And the, the reason is the towns that you'll see that charge a bus fee are municipal towns, not regional towns. We are, not requ we are required by law and not allowed to charge a bus fee. Not only are, do we not, are not, just so you might know this, but I just want it for the greater community. Not only are we not allowed to charge a bus fee in general, we can't even charge the difference between what we receive in Chapter 71, which is regional transportation, and what we spend. It has been something we have brought up uh, to our legislators. I have met with Senator Donahue and, and brought this up as we're, we're handicapped because when um, the law for regional districts came in, they um, said they were going to do 100% fully fund, which is why they said you can't charge a bus fee. They have never hit that 100% target, and yet they still, by law, will not let us charge a fee for the difference. So it is an equal frustration that we as regional districts don't have that opportunity that we share with you, at least have the opportunity. And it has been something that I have brought up to our legislators. So maybe you have too, and continue to do that, because I do think if they're not going to um, fund it as they had said that they can, then they, they need to allow us some opportunity um, to have that option in our district like other municipal districts have down the road. I'm not asking for a fee. I'm asking for a penalty for not being on the bus, which we are paying for the seat for the child to ride. I mean, you all are creating a poverty stress amongst the seniors. It's, it's not good. Thank you. And I'll be out of here. Any other comments or questions? Yeah. Do you want to come up or do you want us to pass back? All right. Someone gave me a letter to read rather than sure. take up. Can I give it to anyone? I'm picking you. The chair. Perfect. Sure. <laughs> Thank you. That way I'm not reading it. Would you I want to read hers up. first or would you? Because I'll have a seat. Uh, let's see. So this is from Anar Shah, uh, and it says, My husband and I moved here from Milford, Mass. in 2014. Over the 10 years that we lived in Milford, we saw the value of our home depreciate. We actually sold it for a $100,000 loss. The reason our property declined so drastically in value is due to the school system. This is why we chose to sell our house at a huge loss and move to Groton. It is a beautiful town, and from what we heard slash read, it had a great school system. And we wanted to leave Milford before our children started public school. Our oldest daughter is currently in kindergarten at Florence Roach. But Groton is not a convenient place to live. It, uh, it's for folks that are willing to drive 15 minutes off the highway to get home. So what will attract future home buyers and what will keep our home values up? The school system. Compare us to towns like Westford, Westboro, Hopkinton, Lexington, Acton, Weston, Littleton, Whalen, Sharon. The value of these homes never falter because they have consistently solid school systems. That is what attracts home buyers. Yes, Groton is a beautiful town with beautiful homes, but Milford too has beautiful homes along with the convenience of uh, three entrances to the highway and close to the Mass Pike, four plus grocery stores along with a Target yet their home values are terrible. It's a no-brainer. If we want to maintain our value, we need to put our money and resources into the school system. Ask any real estate agent. That's the end of the letter. Thank you.
Do you want to have and, something to? Unless someone else wants to go first, doesn't matter. <coughs> Okay. Uh, my name is Marlena Gilbert, 45 Arbor Way, Groton. I'd like to start off, I'd like to thank Dr. Rodriguez and her staff for the extensive and thoughtful work that they have put into the needs assessment. I would like to thank the school committee for re requesting Dr. Rodriguez to compose a budget that would meet all those needs. They were that identified the key fi five key findings of the, of the needs assessment. Our community has had a long time reputation of offering a level one school district. In fact, actually a level one school district is why my family chose to invest in building a new home in Groton and to raise our family. It was an investment that is sure to decrease in value should we not stop the declining of our school system. I'm returning our schools to the formidable level one district that it has traditionally been. But we need to be all aware that this situation we find ourselves in is beyond the concern about getting back to a level one district. This is about acknowledging the needs of our students and either choosing to accommodate those needs or choosing to neglect those needs. This is about finally having an effective administration that has done an exceptional amount of research and collected endless hours of data so that we now know what our kids need. This is something we've never known for many, many years. We live in a totally different world than we lived in back in May 20th, 03. And why May 20th, 03? That is the last time we approved an override to fund our schools. That's more than a decade. It's amazing we've been able to do so much with so little. We have increased security needs that we didn't have years ago. We didn't even dream about the bomb scares. Our children are stressed due to the increase in academic workload that is required and mandated. Our middle school level children, sixth graders, 22% report that they are stressed. 55% of eighth graders report of having high and high levels of stress as a result of their workload. At the high school, 53% of ninth graders, 60% of 10th graders, 66% of 11th graders all report high levels of stress. We do not have the ability to service this need at this point. That's what is included in the needs assessment. According to the Center of Disease Control and Prevention, the percentage of children with an ADH diagnosis, it increases. In, in 2003, it was 7.8% nationally. 9.5 in 2007, up to 11% more diagnosis. That's more IEPs, that's more 504s, that's more money needed. The state has been providing 50% of our school budgets up until a few years ago. They're now dropped a figure down to what, around 35% due, due to underfunding state mandated courses. In summary, this is about having no more excuses not to fund our school budget. This is about stopping the decline of our district, choosing not to neglect the needs of our children. We need to fund all the children's needs identified in the need assessment and not allow the opportunity for our children to be neglected through a contingency of an override. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? All right. Uh, so with that, if there's no other questions or comments, we'll end the public hearing portion of the meeting and uh, resume our regular meeting. So everyone is welcome to stay. Um, let's see, who, uh, was it Mr. Mr. Arena and then? He is here. Uh, do we have some other coaches as well or is he representing? He's representing. Okay. 